Um, yeah, so it was just the adding friction. I was saying that it's it's a very specific science um, in itself. Okay, but, and it's it was very important for like human settlement because it's mainly about studying time, so seasons and um, you know variations, and so that will help actually settling uh, societies, uh, uh, giving a rhythm as well, and ex exploiting the, the the resources, those resources twice. But also uh, a way of um, having space monitoring for navigation, uh, fl migration, flux, and colonization of territory. So when I say colonization, it's just like just pure like going from one place to another and then um, having crops and things, not the way we usually think about. So yeah, and so one of the messages I wanted to give with that introduction is like so on top of that, it's really part of the ecosystem. We know that bird migration, plants, and insects also rely on the night sky. Um, in uh, in terms of stars and things, so it's it's actually quite uh, gives an overview. So now what we call astronomy. So I'm going to focus on obviously ground based astronomy. So here there's a transmission of the atmosphere with respect to the wavelengths, and you can see that the visible wavelengths, where there's the big rainbow, um, is it's partially transparent, and then you have some bands in the infrared, but then becomes opaque again, again here. So in those red zones here, and only the uh, sub millimeter and radio. Uh, wavelengths are going through. So for that, we have different um, type of uh, detectors and observatories. So the most ancient ones, for instance, here at Machu Picchu, with the eye, you can see visible light. Um, then we have amazing visible infrared CCD detectors, which really was a huge jump in the science of astronomy compared to uh, photograph photography ancient time. Um, then in submillimeter, for instance, you have those um, bolometers. And, uh, and detectors for even bigger uh, wavelengths, like 30 centimeters. Here it's the NASA radio telescope in France. Um, so why do we stay, stay on Earth? Is because we want more sensitivity to look at faint uh, objects, more resolution to see the sharpness of each object, but also stability that we can't really have uh, in space. So we want big collecting mirrors. We want to have like extreme mechanical stability. We want to be able to fix and upgrade it uh, Unlike Hubble Space Telescope, where we send like a few astronauts to, to fix it, it wants that to be really easier. Um, also to test your instrumental concept, because uh, you might know that if you want to send a telescope, an instrument in space, uh, it has to be a very robust technology. So you can't send the latest breaking uh, um, instrumental concept. But also the commissioning time. So if some of you have been have worked on JWST, you know that it took a long time, so it's usually shorter time uh, on Earth, and also the operation lifetime, because if you run out of, uh, for instance, cryogenic liquid in space, then your telescope is not, the instrument's not working um, as much as it should, whereas in France, it's, uh, sorry, on Earth, it's easy to refuel. Um, sorry, I'm a bit <laughs> confused because I was just like five minutes ago, I was uh, giving another uh, talk to other people and I'll have to switch back and my mind is not really, I'm not really ready to do that. And it's, it was in French as well. So anyway, I'm a bit confused, but it's okay. Um, so yeah, just to like, there were huge milestones in terms of size of telescopes on earth and, you know, the, the, in terms not only on size, but um, you have those major reg runs here. So now we are in the era of uh, 30 meter class telescopes and also with a new detectors coming in and new devices such as astrophonic tonic device that's going to spinning ah. astronomy is getting more and more crazy and thanks to that we have a wealth of discoveries so here there's only tiny few examples of you also the image of the black hole of our Milky Way here um the first baby planets on um at birth the first potential exomoon forming here, this Oumuamua uh, asteroid that was crossing the solar system, the further quasar ever, and so on and so on, and the closest planet to Earth, approximately. So I want to focus on hunting exoplanet, not only because that's what I'm working about, because um, I think that's relevant to the topic. So we found more than 5,000 exoplanets today, and they, they range in that. So of our findings, about 4% are like terrestrial planets. And among those uh, planets, we found a bunch of habitable planets. So this is a very debated concept of where potentially you could find liquid water on their surface. Um, I mean, there's many debates on that because Mars and Venus are actually in very closely habitable zone, but they don't have any ways of being um, habitable. And even on Earth, uh, having intelligent episodes, another debate. 
But we here we are, and we are really at the edge of searching for biosignatures on those exoplanets. So here is an example of like the typical spectra that we see from Earth, which is the blue planet covered 70% by oceans. Um, and it's actually a community consensus in astronomy that it's, it is a priority to look for uh, signatures of life on other worlds. So it was shown in the NASA Decadal Survey, it was shown at ESA Voyage uh, 2050 and ESO Survey 2021. And meanwhile, uh, this is the famous image of the pay blue dot, so the Earth seen at 6 million kilometers from here. You have this little thing here, and when you go closer to there, you see on the right side is France and on the left side is UK, and you see this thin layer here of atmosphere that you can see thanks to the glow. So the glow is about 90 kilometers, which is about the size of the atmosphere between 80 and 90 kilometers, um, 100 kilometers altitude. And everything below that contains basically everything that we know about life everything that exists and that we also don't know about it. There are so many things that we should, we, we're still um, on the verge of discovering and everything happens here. That's Spaceship Earth. And that's this tiny little thing that maintains all what we know today. The atmosphere of Earth is really amazing, as you probably know, and the main source of energy that we have uh, to sustain all of this uh, life is coming from the sun mainly, so 340 watt per meter square. And without the greenhouse gas of this atmosphere, uh, it would be minus 18 degrees Celsius in average instead of the 16 degrees Celsius that we have today. And the first layer of atmosphere called the troposphere between zero to eight uh, on the pole and 16 kilometers um, along the equator contains 80% of the mass of the atmosphere. And within those 80%, it contains almost all like 99% of the water. Um, so if we have those clouds and this weather uh, things, everything happens at the troposphere. Every weather uh, events happens here. Um, and as you know, you have currents and they are mainly driven between the heat exchange uh, between ocean and lands because they don't have the same uh, thermal coefficient, but also by the fact that the earth is rotating. So those um, with the Coriolis force, it just like goes around. And at the end of the day, you have a chaotic system. So the climate itself, the global climate is driven by oscillations and cycles. You might have heard of El Nino thousand oscillations, but you have mini oscillations. And all this to say that because it's a chaotic system, a small change, can have a huge impact as well. And here is the most important uh, plot of all days, where you see the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere in per, per millions. Um, and so you see in orange the monthly mean. So you see that in winter and summer is not the same because in um, like usually it's northern hemisphere when it's springtime, there is uh, less breathing of CO2, whereas when it's winter time, there is, so the, it's actually the, I like this phrase that I heard actually with Leo the first time um, during conference that the, the earth is actually breathing and you really see animations where you see those things, it's really beautiful. And so if you just do the, the, the annual trend in black, you see this um, massive increase. So today we're about 415 plus or minus zero uh, PPM, which was about 50% more than before pre-industrial era. So in 17, uh, 18th century. Um, so it's a huge increase. And this shape here, this exponential growth, like this, this increase of uh, carbon dioxide that you find here on the, on the left, is you can find it in many places, actually. So you can send, see it in methane, in, in, in N2O, in um, like loss of Arctic ice sheet and so on. So you always find this trend here somewhere, either like decreasing because that's a negative effect or like, um, or like positive effect. And also, I haven't put it here, but you find the same kind of trend in um, GDP, for instance, the gross product of countries and in economics uh, uh, markers. So the IPCC that you all heard about, I guess, the Internet Panel Government for Climate Change um, just released the assessment report number six. So there's three working groups. The, so the first one is the one I'm, I'm, I'm mostly going to talk about is the physical basis. But I do engage you to read at least the summary for policymakers. They're a few pages long and they're really chopped, chopped. So it's kind of easy, okay to read. It's still like a bit um, <laughs> difficult, but there's a lot of information. Um, and what we know is those changes, those trends, they really clearly are human induced. We know about that. It's 100% sure there's a consensus. We know it's clear. So we knew it before, but now it's like 100%. So you can't deny that. 
it's really human activities that make climate change and it's already affecting weather as you know i mean there are some uh, storms at the moment in, in germany for instance there is a heat wave um, over many countries in europe and you probably heard also a bit further out in pakistan what happened was really terrible um, so we expect from these changes, this 50% um, increase of uh, CO2, uh, more climate extremes in every region across the globe. And you have like, yeah, heat waves, every precipitation, droughts, tropical cyclones, and so on. Um, and one thing I also wanted to show is that um, it's, it's very, I mean, you all heard about that, the 10% the richest people, so that's a Oxfam I plot here. Uh, are responsible for most, like 50% of the emissions. And the consequences are so very inhomogeneous. That was one of the big uh, IPCC highlights as well, the la latest report. We knew that before, but now it's like really settled. Um, the people, the, the countries who will suffer the most from the climate change are the most, uh, most vulnerable, actually the one that emits the less. And it's really sad when you think about that little pale blue dot here that it's just one little planet and we're all in the same and we all have the same share the same atmosphere um so one thing was to think about like how it's like to to think about astronomy because of this you know first slide i showed and um how important it was for society and we've been more and more away from that so today i think there are like uh, more than 50 people who can't see the stars because of the light pollution, for instance. So the idea was to have a look at how this affects uh, astronomy, so observational astronomy, of course, uh, and on ground based. And we do have more than 30 years of observatories which are collecting weather data for their own operations. We also have now uh, data from satellites, from airports, balloons, and everything that collects data. And one important thing is the third item. So you have the weather reanalysis data so there is the European one, the Japanese one, the US one, and they are very, very precise. The European one is very good. It's called ECMWF, so the Weather uh, Medium Range Forecast Monitor. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I think there was an M too much. Um, but those are freely available. I mean, you can anyone can download them and you can um, plot the things. And they're really accurate, mainly uh, in the northern hemisphere. It's a bit more difficult in the southern because there are less lands and less airports and less data. Um, and then another aspect, the last point, is you can use climate projection that has been led by the IPCC. So they, they asked for different institutes worldwide. They gave the, the initial conditions. They said, okay, with this scenario here, we receive that much sunlight from the sun, and we have that amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. What happens, basically? And they compare the results, of course, with the past data. Uh, and then they project that to the to make sure that it's real, that it matches. If not, then the model is wrong. And then, then they can project up to 2,100, so a century from here. Um, and they have more or less high spatial resolution. It depends where. So, and yeah, as I said, many institutes are doing that. So you can really compare between institutes. Um, and so, of course, when I did that work, I got in touch with many climatologists to check that I was not saying weird stuff and to learn a lot from them. And I've been learning a lot the past few years. And it's, uh, yeah, it's not my prime science. So it's like difficult. And I claim here I'm not a climatologist, but I'm making sure that I'm working with people so I don't say weird stuff. But they also have a unique sample. They also work with near chaotic system and in our processes. It's also multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary uh, uh, science. And they also have observation in remote location, for instance, Antarctica or in oceans. So I just realized by talking to climatologists that we more or less have the same way of working, the same type of science, the same physics behind. Um, and one difference was that often they're not really listened to. Whereas when you say astronomy, people are like so interested because they want to know about life outside of exoplanets and things very fuzzy. So we have the chance to say that. And I remember a climatologist who told me, I'm always saying that story because I think that's very important, who told me that hearing an astronomer saying there is no planet D really makes sense. So I think we should also raise the voice. And that's why I'm also spending a lot of time of my research time to do all this and work with climate scientists because I think we have to work hand in hand. I'm not here to replace anyone, of course, I'm just we have to work together. So what defines the quality of an astronomical site? So there are a few things. So of course the latitude, because you want to look at many stars. So for instance, close to Milky Way, a place without clouds, or that many clouds, clear skies, not polluted by lights, uh, stable weather. Um, you want to have access to energy as well to make your telescope work or to operational resources like access to water, to food, <laughs> or to like uh, trash um, management, and also a certain social stability. So I always give the examples here. So 
of Chile. So um, yeah, clearly one of the driest places on earth after Antarctica. Um, you have, for instance, here they install solar panels close to La Silla. You have three or two, it depends on the source, and I can't find it. I've been sending emails to so many people to know about those trucks. So those trucks are two, two, uh, 20,000 liters of fresh water coming every day at the Parnell Observatory. And on some people say it's two, some people say it's three, so I'm not sure, but it's a lot. So every day there is at least two trucks like this coming to Paranal Observatory to feed the people with fresh water. And the social stability, um, you've heard the protest in Chile in 2019, so just before COVID, 20, 19, 19. Um, and at that moment, the observatories could not um, be operational. Um, and also at some point there were some strikes by the students, so they cut the fibers, so the data couldn't be sent to the headquarters. Uh, in Vaching, uh, Germany, um, and also COVID. And so that's why I'm saying social stability is very important. I'm giving a few examples here. Um, so now one of the first thing that we think of when we talk about climate change is global warming. So because it's so obvious that greenhouse gas is just gonna warm the surface temperature. So we know that the global surface temperature uh, increased by about 1.1 degrees Celsius uh, the last decades. Um, and it's larger of a land than oceans because of, I told you, the, the thermal coefficient is not the same. Um, so we had a look at the Paranal Observatory um, data. Uh, so this observatory is here since 98. So we have data in red since 1908 here. And we looked at the reanalysis data. So you see there is an offset, which is potentially due to the fact that uh, Paranal Observatory is high up on the mountain. And the reanalysis data, they have pixels of about 31 kilometer. So we had to interpolate it and so, but the trend is there. So you can see that the, like just the trend is there. So it, it kind of works. And there's a main increase of about 1.5, which is um, corresponds to the increase over land. And by using the worst case uh, scenario that the IPCC defines, so the 8.5 watt per meter square added to the uh, radiative forcing of earth by the emissions of greenhouse gas by human activities, it happens that we could reach about four degrees Celsius in two, two, 2100 at this location. Um, the direct threat, so the, when I started working on that, I remember I received email of people from uh, US and Australia telling me that that's actually the main uh, direct threat more than just you know getting warmer. Um, so here you have an example of fry fire in summer 2017, and the Mount Graham has been uh, threatened in 96, 2004, 17, 21 by fire um, in the US. So in the US, the number of wildfires remains more or less the same. But if you look at the intensity, intensity of those fires, it's much bigger because it's drier because of the wind as well, because of uh, all of those things. So we know today that um, anthropogenic climate change is triggering, igniting more uh, climate, uh, more wildfires in some places, of course, like USA or, or bushfires in Australia. Um, so yeah, that's one of the quotes from the IPCC report that also says that, that in some regions where it's specifically dry because water atmosphere demands a lot of water, so we expect drought uh, on the ground, uh, then it's it's uh, become way more, um, yeah, more wildfires. Uh, so we have more what we call fire weather, so weather conditions that can trigger or sustain wildfires. So that's one thing. So there's temperature, soil moisture, humidity, and wind. Uh, so if you look at, uh, for instance, that was summer 2020, the map from the NASA Observatory of the wildfires, and you can also oops, correlate it with the aerosol. Um, so if you have aerosol, that's very important because it darkens the atmosphere. So it's a very good example of feedback, climate feedback uh, effect. It changes a little bit the albedo, but also it creates clouds because there is a nucleation process. So when I say aerosols, it's like little particles that are in suspension in the air. And uh, yeah, you can have, if, if the air is humid, then you can have nucleation and it forms clouds or like um, fog, basically the ashes and haze you see uh, at a fire. And it's also linked with carbon monoxide and it releases a lot of water from the trees themselves that are burning, uh, but also a lot of methane and those on top of those dark ashes, those, this uh, black soot uh, that we see. So it's really a good example of how like more wildfire is like entering the loop. 
Um, so there are many uh, in astronomy. So there is a Mount Stromlo in 2003 in Australia. It's been, uh, I think, five of the six telescopes been completely destroyed. Uh, Siding Spring Observatory in 2013, half of the place has been destroyed and the headquarters where the astronomers were staying got completely destroyed. And this image, I think, I mean, both images are really impressive. And more recently, the Mount Wilson, the historical telescope, um, I had the chance to visit back a few years ago. It's been like, you see an image like this is, is very, um, it talks by itself. And even more, I mean, we have more and more, we know that. So in 2020, the Leak Observatory was very close to get um, completely destroyed, as you can see on those two images. And the picture I showed you at the beginning of the talk with the City Observatory. And I also like this picture for another reason, because you see the clouds and the haze, and you see how the, the sunlight is reddened by the presence of haze. Um, and this haze, these ashes from those fires, and that was on the same uh, day, that's another image from uh, NASA Modis. Yes, yeah, not the right source. <laughs> anyway, um, and you can see how big is that plume of, uh, of ashes from the fire. I mean, this is the, this is the coast of, of, um, of USA and you can see here. And so if you go about a kilometer, a thousand kilometers from here, so that's actually the, the source from the EDI, IDI is the um, uh, International Dark Sky Association, which is born the same year as IPCC, by the way, in 88. Anyway, so if you, they actually made some tests uh, in natural parks because they wanted to have this dark sky um, um, thing on, for the natural park to have astrotourism and so on. So they, they, they saw that the concentration of uh, aerosols, uh, which are mainly uh, for fires, the 2.5 microns, so the PM 2.5 microns uh, type of aerosol was multiplied by 10 and the sky background was multiplied by 20. So the, the brightness of the sky, the sky was not dark anymore. Uh, it was like 23 times uh, uh, brighter. And on top of that, as you know, the atmosphere so has two things. Um, so it absorbs the light that comes from the stars, but it also emits its own heat. So the emission, you can see here, that's basically the black body. You can guess here. So that's the Earth's own thermal emission that is going up <laughs> and uh, the greenhouse gases. Uh, in the atmosphere, uh, absorbing and remitting this, this uh, light, this thermal radiation in many directions, and some of them go back to the ground. Uh, so that's basically what you see here with this shape. And the second thing is the absorption by the atmosphere. So this time it's like the light from the stars above us going through the atmosphere and being absorbed by mainly water, actually, but also all of the greenhouse gases. Um, so the main, uh, yeah, the main contribution is water vapor, and it's highly variable and highly featured as well. So it changes a lot. And one uh, image also for the emission, I didn't say, but you have here, if you're looking for uh, in 2.2, so in, in here actually, uh, there's not much background as you can see, like the, the black bodies are pretty short, but the more you go towards um, five, 10 microns, uh, micrometers, actually there's M missing here uh, in wavelengths, then you will have this background. And same, it's, you can see it's very patchy, it's highly structured. Uh, and it's, you don't see here, but I have videos where you can see how, how fast it can move. So humidity is also very important for astronomy. You, you probably know that if you're observers as well. And so what the IPCC report says that the global uh, total colon water vapor um, has increased and we expect that, but then for um, it's very local effects as well. Uh, the little uh, planet you see here, so you see Chile is uh, yellow, which means very dry, and in blue, it means that it's very uh, humid. And that's an example of parallel observatory under the rain. I really love that picture somehow. I really love rain. <laughs> um, anyway, I think it's, it's quite impressive to see that place, which is so dry usually to have so much water. Um, so to talk about humidities, usually we talk about four variables. So the absolute humidity, which is like the amount of water in a given volume. Um, or the specific humidity, so the, the mass ratio between a saturated um, amount of water and a non, what you have in reality or the relative humidity. And usually astronomers use the principal water vapor, so the PWV, which is the integral over a line of sight. So it's really like when you look at an astronomical object, like all of the water content that you have between uh, on that side. And an important thing is that it depends a lot on the temperature, um, that's the plasius Clapeyron uh, relationship, whatever. But at 30 degrees, you can have seven times more water vapor than at zero degrees. So that's the important thing. So that's why in like countries, uh, like tropical countries, you have like a lot of uh, 
But there is uh, other side effects than just closing the dome in the case of the picture when it's too humid. So you can think about leaching, uh, corrosion, uh, everything that works with high voltage might be uh, need to be turned off. And also there are interesting limitation and their human environment. So for instance, I'm working at Ati Optics, we use those uh, deformable mirrors uh, with piezo uh, electric um, actuators. And those are very sensitive to humidity. So we are afraid of breaking them. <laughs> so after above 50%, we have to shut down the, the, the instrument because we don't want to break this. So this causes also for precipitations, which is something else. So globally, the precipitation over land has a little bit increased, has actually increased. Um, so as you saw with the floodings and things, but as I said before, it's a very local effect. So it really depends on the interactions with ocean and land. Um, so it turns out that the few research that have been done before um, uh, in Chile, in Atacama, it might become drier. Uh, but it's very difficult actually to have such a good resolution to really say this place is going to be drier, this place is going to be. So there are people working on that. Um, there's no direct answer to that. Um, yeah. But, so we don't know much, but it's going to change. The, the, the We don't know in which way exactly. Okay. Um, and then talking about clear sky, our so cloudiness precipitation. I just wanted to give you, you know, a bunch of uh, keywords more than actual. <laughs> things, but yeah, there are many things uh, that we are responsible for by our activities as humans, um, the way we live today. Um, and yeah, it, it changes everything and everything together might affect uh, in a way or another uh, way of observing um, of doing astronomy. But yeah. um, one important thing that you probably heard about is optical turbulence. So we usually talk about seeing to say how uh, the quality of the, the sky in terms of turbulence. So the atmospheric turbulence make that your object is blurry instead of being just defined by the size of your telescope, like as in space, um, the light is distorted. So it goes like in many different directions. And at the end of the day, you, the image of your star is like a big potato and you can't do much uh, high resolution science, high spatial resolution science with that. So the thing is uh, the lambda over air uh, and the air looks like that. The thing I wanted you to look at is this uh, thing here, the CN square profile. Uh, is the index, the refractive index uh, profile, and Z is the altitude, so that the plots here. So this is important because it gives you which altitude accounts more in the scene. So we used to say that scene is mainly due to the exchange with surface temperature. So um, at night, so during the day, the sun has been like beaming on the ground, and at night, this, this heat is going up in the sky, as I, uh, we talked about before, and this... Um, yeah, the warm air is going up and the cold air is going down and it doesn't mix really well because the thermal coefficient of air is really bad. So it makes bubbles of different size of like cold and hot air and the index, the optical index depends mainly on temperature, but also a little bit on pressure. And so it's very important to know where it stems from. And so empirically it's been, it's been proven that it's indeed mainly the ground, but also the so-called jet stream layer. So um, the jet stream is a, is a wind that comes at um, 12 kilometer altitude. So it's not all over the planet first. It's only in some location, uh, in three locations at 30. So you have the equator so zero. So at 30 degrees, 60 degrees, you have like convection that makes that you have those very fast uh, wind. Uh, so it's like a belt. I'm going to, I think, show you in the next slide how it looks like. But it's like a wind that is at 12 kilometers altitude in some areas. So as I told you, 30 degrees and 60 degrees in both sides, southern and northern hemisphere. Um, and it's very thin, it's about one kilometer width. It can go really, really fast. So you can see the wind speed here. Um, is that's an, I think this one is an average in winter and this one is average in summer. So it's, with, we're in the southern hemisphere. So in the Chilean, this is in Chile, uh, in the Chilean winter, this can go really, really high. So 50 meter reverse wind. And we've observed peaks at 70 meter per second. Um, and you can see here this CN square I was talking about that the contribution of this jet stream is actually very important. And that's what we wanted to show with those plots. So from the ground, uh, we can kind of expect that it would be increasing because of this temperature surface increase. Then there are more exchanges. But on the other hand, the air itself 
is also the is also warmer. And that we know of because we have the measures I showed you before. And we know that it's more and more frequent with time. I didn't show you the plot today, but so that's that's for sure. So actually it's not that obvious how the thing will evolve with uh, climate change and global warming mainly. So we had those plots from the parallel observatory again showing the thing as a function of time. But you have to know that we have different events, like changing the dims here and here to the, the seeing monitor and leveling the mountain and putting more telescopes. So either it's due to the difference or indeed there is an increase due to surface temperature increase. But it's not, we can't say today what is what, and it's not that obvious to understand how climate scales, so synoptic scales can affect turbulent scales. Um, so the jet stream I was talking to you about, so we know that it affects our data. So that's the typical data I'm working on. So I'm working high contrast imaging, trying to find planets million times fainter than the star, which is at the center here. And so because we are in that regime of very high dynamic, we can see tiny, tiny little effects from the atmosphere. And we never saw that thing before the latest generation instruments because it was just a tiny effect. But now we see it. And as you can see in those images, it's super important. Try to find the planet here. You can't find anything because they're like completely covered by this jet stream. So at the same time, that's the same date. Um, you can see those, those pink um, things are actually the jet stream. So this map shows the wind at 200 hectopascal, so at 12 kilometers altitude. Um, and you can see that here it's very, very intense uh, going above parallel. So we're really in, in this subtropical jet stream. And we know that there is a correlation with how the jet stream is uh, intense. Uh, so that's the velocity at the jet stream of the wind at the jet stream uh, in, on the top. Uh, and here is the relation with El Nino thousand observ um, oscillation. So we can't see a huge effect here. And I think it's because we, have, um, we haven't uh, looked at extremes. And so we just took a mean. And I think that wasn't a good idea. So I want to redo that plot for the last two years. And I never had the time to do it. But anyway, um, but what we know from the data I show you is that we, in 2015, we had this effect all the time during winter. It was so annoying, actually. So people who had data from 2015, they're a bit annoyed. But so we know that there is a correlation. And that's that's also something that climate scientists know, of course, uh, that the jet stream is super important for the weather pattern. So for instance, if the jet stream changes, um, the fact that the Sahara is very dry, you know, might, might come higher. So it's super important in the way uh, there is heat exchange. Anyway, so there might be a slight increase uh, but in the end, the IPC report said the, the prediction is more that they expect the, those jet stream uh, bands to shift pole walls uh, in the north and in the south, of course, the same pole south, and the oscillation as well increased. But also sometimes that we had hints that the speed might increase as well. So there are more and more events of like very strong jet stream. Um, so related to those uh, speeds. <laughs> There is also the question of storms and cyclones. So you also heard that there are more and more intense uh, major tropical cyclones. Um, clearly, I mean, we've seen that in the news, all of us. And one of the things is that the, the peak intensity is also shifting uh, to the north. So I don't know if there is a counterpart in the south. It was actually very difficult to, to, to find uh, information on that. Um, but also, for instance, some people um, wrote papers saying that there might be an increase uh, threat of tropical cyclones, for instance, in Hawaii, which covers, which hosts um, one of the most important um, observatory at the Mauna Kea here. In uh, yeah, and so that's the number of tornadoes. So to consider with care, because you know it's uh, uh, here before we didn't have that many data and, and definition, but clearly we saw that the the intensity, the strength, is really increasing um, with the years. Yeah, that's uh, for USA, those two plots. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about that. It's just uh, the IPC. You can have all of those uh, summary of, of the increase and decrease of, uh, for instance, here, aridity, uh, droughts, and so on. Um, you can have a look at that. And one last thing. Um, so as I said before, you need to have access to resource, but there is also a problem of uh, light pollution from bottom up that we haven't talked about that also really affects uh, astronomy. Obviously, but also Tom done because now we're starting to have, for instance, the satellite constellations that do affect um, our ability to do ground-based uh, observations. Uh, access to energy, again, that's really a problem. When we think about a world where we will have less and less access to energy, how do we sustain those huge telescopes? So probably at some point we'll have to choose. 
local population. That's something so that for the building of the 30 meter telescope, which was supposed to be at the top of Mauna Kea, it was huge uh, discussions and problems. Um, and that's also something we absolutely have to take into account as astronomers, but also with uh, animals living here. So what we call common salism. So this little guy here passed away because um, so the, the food that is stocked at Paranal, so in case something happens, you have, I think, if I remember well, you have like three weeks of food that is stocked somewhere at Paranal Observatory. Um, makes sense, right? If there is an earthquake and we can't access to uh, roads anymore and so on, or war or whatever. So there is three weeks. Um, there's a lot of food. Food means also uh, like rats, for instance. And rats means that we don't want rats, so they put those little things uh, against rats. And this uh, fox, um, ate the rat thingy and we, we found him dead so not really cool and also there was a leakage at some point um in panel so from the water from the uh, lavatory i think or something and so there's a little pond and in this little pond like plants started to grow and, and so on so it's very interesting to see how like you just have a little pond and you just mess up with the local ec ecosystem here so because in the talk i talked only about climate change obviously because the idea was to keep track of astronomy as a way of talking about climate change but there's a, the same stuff so ipcc i don't know if you know the I, ipbs so it's the same as ipc but for biodiversity and they have a lot of things to say it's very similar and same for ida the um, uh, dark sky association so uh, to conclude on that because it's, been, it's already super late, <laughs> just seeing the, the time now. Um, so yeah, astronomers uh, were here now. Uh, as I said, there are a few more studies uh, going on. So mine is just a rough summary, giving just a keyword and stuff. I'm not an expert at all, but the thing I want to say is so that either as astronomers, we witness the problem. Uh, we are scientists, we know, we see what's happening. We're part of the problem as well, because we're building huge telescopes demanding a lot of resources, flying around all over. And the last point I wanted to raise with that uh, study in that talk is that we also suffer from the problem. So even in a selfish point of view, so to say, um, we have to be careful about that. So thank you for your, your attention. Thank you very much for seeing fantastic really packed talk with lots of information slides images uh, figures and of course a very important message um i think there's probably going to be lots of questions uh, although indeed um it has <laughs> already exceeded a little, a little bit the time but we'll leave it open for questions we are still recording so if anyone does not want to appear on the recording then either wait until i stop the recording after a few questions or put the question if you have one in the chat please and um until there are questions and people who have raised their hand i'll just have a a beginner question, perhaps, um, which uh, is actually a physics 101 question, but um, I'm not quite sure if I got it right. So you said that if it gets warmer, then the air can, of course, hold more uh, water vapor, right? the, the partial pressure of air can increase. But I'm just wondering, what does that mean concretely for Paranal? So if it gets warmer there by a few degrees, you said up to four degrees, will there also be more water? Or does that then still depend on if there is indeed also more precipitation and yeah the problem is that locally it yeah. really depends on so many things it depends on how far you are from the ocean or big waters and the vegetation as well so sometimes panel receives those um uh, rivers atmospheric rivers from the amazonian amazonian forest for instance um, but it really depends why you are exactly uh, so I can't say exactly what it would mean for Parnell because you have taken into account all of those things. So I think the, the expected uh, decrease of humidity at Parnell is mainly due to the, uh, the fact that there is no vegetation and the, the thing is stopping uh, the current by the ocean that's stopped by the uh, Andes. Was it your question or no? Yeah, okay, I mean, mostly. So essentially, I guess the, the climate models aren't precise enough to, to predict it for. So humidity apparently is one of the, I, I already said mm. that many times, but mm. it's apparently very difficult to like understand because mm. there are so many, you know, loops with evapotranspiration um, and the, uh, for instance, at La Silla, when they monitored humidity, they realized that at some point they did a dam for um, uh, keeping water for, I, I don't remember if it was hydroelectric or if it was just like a stock of water. But anyway, they suddenly had a huge uh, lake, uh, man-made, uh, and they actually 
saw the increase in humidity in the data due to that. So that's why I'm saying it's super local and it's really hard to say mm -hmm. this prediction. So globally, we know that humidity is going right. to increase for sure. So yeah. yeah. OK, well, thanks a lot. Um, I see no more question now. Perhaps that's because we're still recording. So I will stop the recording now. And thank you again.